from the revocation of the Edict of Nantes to the French Revolution in 1789. The persecutions occasioned by the revocation of the Edict of Nantes took place under Louis XIV. This edict was made by Henry the Great of France in 1598 and secured to the Protestants an equal right in every respect, whether civil or religious. All those privileges Louis XIV confirmed to the Protestants by another statute called the Edict of Nismes and kept them inviolably to the end of his reign. On the ascension of Louis XIV, the kingdom was almost ruined by civil wars. At this critical juncture, the Protestants, heedless of our Lord's admonition, they that take the sword shall perish with the sword, took such an active part in favor of the king that he was constrained to acknowledge himself indebted to their arms for his establishment on the throne. Instead of cherishing and rewarding that party who had fought for him, he reasoned that the same power which had protected could overturn him, and listening to the popish machinations, he began to issue out prescriptions and restrictions indicative of his final determination. Rochelle was presently fettered with an incredible number of denunciations. Montauban and Malau were sacked by soldiers. Popish commissioners were appointed to preside over the affairs of the Protestants, and there was no appeal from their ordinance except to the king's council. This struck at the root of their civil and religious exercises and prevented them being Protestants from suing a Catholic in any court of law. This was followed by another injunction to make an inquiry in all parishes into whatever the Protestants had said or done for 20 years past. This filled the prisons with innocent victims and condemned others to the galleys or banishment. Protestants were expelled from all offices, trades, privileges, and employees, thereby depriving them of the means of getting their bread. And they proceeded to such excess in their brutality that they would not suffer even the midwives to officiate, but compelled their women to submit themselves in that crisis of nature to their enemies, the brutal Catholics. Their children were taken from them to educate by the Catholics and at seven years of age made to embrace popery. The reformed were prohibited from relieving their own sick or poor from all private worship and divine service was to be performed in the presence of a popish priest. To prevent the unfortunate victims from leaving the kingdom, all the passages on the frontiers were strictly guarded Yet by the good hand of God, about 150,000 escaped their vigilance and emigrated to different countries to relate the dismal narrative. All that has been related hitherto were only infringements on their established charter, the Edict of Nantes. At length, the diabolical revocation of that edict passed on the 18th of October, 1685, and was registered the 22nd, contrary to all form of law. Instantly, the dragoons were quartered upon the Protestants throughout the realm and filled all France with the like news that the king would no longer suffer any Huguenots in his kingdom and therefore they must resolve to change their religion. Hereupon the attendants in every parish, which were popish governors and spies set over the Protestants, assembled the reformed inhabitants and told them they must without delay turn Catholics, either freely or by force. The Protestants replied that they were ready to sacrifice their lives and estates to the king, but their consciences being gods, they could not so dispose of them. Instantly the troops seized the gates and avenues of the cities, and placing guards in all of the passages, entered with sword in hand, crying, Die or be Catholics. In short, they practiced every wickedness and horror they could devise to force them to change their religion. They hanged both men and women by their hair or their feet and smoked them with hay until they were nearly dead. And if they still refused to sign a recantation, they hung them up again and repeated their barbarities until, wearied out with torments without death, they forced many to yield to them. Others they plucked off all the hair of their heads and beards with their pincers. Others they threw on great fires and pulled them out again, repeating it until they exhorted a promise to recant. Some they stripped naked, and after offering them the most infamous insults, they stuck them with pins from head to foot, and lanced them with pen knives. And sometimes with red-hot pincers, they dragged them by the nose until they promised to turn. 
Sometimes they tied feathers and husbands while they ravished their wives and daughters before their eyes. Multitudes they imprisoned in the most noisome dungeons where they practiced all sorts of torments in secret. Their wives and children they shut up in monasteries. Such as endeavored to escape by flight were pursued in the woods and hunted in the fields, nor did any condition or quality screen them from the ferocity of these infernal dragoons. Even the members of parliament and military officers, though on actual service, were ordered to quit their posts and repair directly to their houses to suffer the like storm. Such as complained to the king were sent to the Bastille, where they drank the same cup. The bishops and the intendants marched at the head of the dragoons with a troop of missionaries, monks, and other ecclesiastes to animate the soldiers to an execution so agreeable to their holy church and so glorious to their demon god and their tyrant king. In forming the edict to repeal the edict of Nantes, the council were divided. Some would have all ministers detained and forced into popery as well as the laity. Others were for banishing them because their presence would strengthen the Protestants in perseverance, and if they were forced to turn, they would ever be secret and powerful enemies in the bosom of the church by their great knowledge and experience in controversial matters. Their reason prevailing, they were sentenced to banishment, and only fifteen days allowed them to depart the kingdom. On the same day that the edict for revoking the Protestants' charter was published, they demolished their churches and banished their ministers, whom they allowed but 24 hours to leave Paris. The papists, who would not suffer them to dispose of their effects, and threw every obstacle in their way to delay their escape until the limited time was expired which subjected them to condemnation for life to the galleys. The guards were doubled at the seaports, and the prisoners were filled with the victims, who endured torments and wants at which human nature must shudder. The suffering of the ministers and others who were sent to the galleys seemed to exceed all. Chained to the oar, they were exposed to the open air night and day, at all seasons and in all weathers, and with through weakness of body they fainted under the oar, instead of a cordial to revive them, or viands to refresh them, they received only the lashes of a scourge, or the blows of a cane or rope's end. For the want of sufficient clothing and necessary cleanliness, they were most grievously tormented with vermin and cruelly pinched with the cold, which removed by night the executioners who beat and tormented them by day. Instead of a bed, they were allowed without any covering, but their wretched apparel, which was a shirt of the corset canvas, a little jerkin of red serge, slit on each side up to the armholes, with open sleeves that reached not to the elbow. And once in three years, they had a coarse frock and a little cap to cover their heads, which were always kept close shaved as a mark of their infamy. The allowance of provision was as narrow as the sentiments of those who condemned them to such miseries, and their treatment when sick is too shocking to relate, doomed to die upon the boards of a dark hold, covered with vermin and without the least convenience for the calls of nature. Nor was it among the least of the horrors they endured that as ministers of Christ and honest men, they were chained side by side to felons and the most execrable villains whose blasphemous tongues were never idle. If they refused to hear mass, they were sentenced to the bastinado, of which dreadful punishment the following is a description. Preparatory to it, the chains are taken off and the victims delivered into the hands of the Turks that preside at the oars, who strip them quite naked and stretching them upon a great gun, they are held so that they cannot stir, during which there reigns an awful silence throughout the galley. The Turk who is appointed the executioner and who thinks the sacrifice acceptable to his prophet Mohammed most cruelly beats the wretched victim with a rough cudgel or knotty rope's end until the skin is flayed off his bones and he is near the point of expiring. Then they apply a most tormenting mixture of vinegar and salt and consign him to that most intolerable hospital where thousands under their cruelties have expired. Martyrdom of John Callus. 
We pass over many other individual martyrdoms to insert that of John Callis, which took place as recently as 1761 and is an indubitable proof of the bigotry of popery and shows that neither experience nor improvement can root out the inveterate prejudices of the Roman Catholics or render them less cruel or inexorable to the Protestants. John Callis was a merchant of the city of Toulouse, where he had been settled and lived in good repute and had married an English woman of French extraction. Callis and his wife were Protestants and had five sons whom they educated in the same religion, but Louis, one of the sons, became a Roman Catholic, having been converted by a maidservant who had lived in the family about 30 years. The father, however, did not express any resentment or ill will upon the occasion, but kept the maid in the family and settled an annuity upon the son. In October 1761, the family consisted of John Callis and his wife, one woman servant, Mark Anthony Callis, the eldest son, and Peter Callis, the second son. Mark Antony was bred to the law, but could not be admitted to practice on account of his being a Protestant. Hence he grew melancholy, read all the books he could procure relative to suicide, and seemed determined to destroy himself. To this may be added that he led a dissipated life, which was greatly addicted to gaming, and did all which could constitute the character of a libertine, on which account his father frequently reprehended him, and sometimes in terms of severity, which considerably added to the gloom that seemed to oppress him. On the 13th of October, 1761, Mr. Gobert Lavice, a young gentleman about 19 years of age, the son of Lavice, a celebrated advocate of Toulouse, about five o'clock in the evening, was met by John Callis, the father, and the eldest son, Mark Antony, who was his friend. Callis, the father, invited him to supper, and the family and their guests sat down in a room up one pair of stairs, the whole company consisting of Callis, the father, and his wife, Antony and Peter Callis, the sons, and Levice, the guest, no other person being in the house except the maidservant, who has been already mentioned. It was now about seven o'clock. The supper was not long, but before it was over, Antony left the table and went into the kitchen, which was on the same floor as he was accustomed to do. The maid asked him if he was cold. He answered, quite the contrary, I burn, and then left her. In the meantime, his friend and family left the room they had supped in and went into a bedchamber. The father and Levice sat down together on a sofa, the younger son Peter in an elbow chair and the mother in another chair, and without making any inquiry after Anthony, continued in conversation together until about nine and 10 o'clock. When Levice took his leave and Peter, who had fallen asleep, was wakened to attend him with a light. On the ground floor of Callis' house was a shop and a warehouse, the latter of which was divided from the shop by a pair of folding doors. When Peter Callis and Levice came downstairs into the shop, they were extremely shocked to see Antony hanging in his shirt from a bar which he had laid across the top of the two folding doors, having half opened them for that purpose. On discovery of this horrid spectacle, they shrieked out, which brought down Callis the father, the mother being seized with such terror as kept her trembling in the passage above. When the maid discovered what had happened, she continued below either because she feared to carry an account of it to her mistress, or because she busied herself in doing some good office to her master, who was embracing the body of his son and bathing it in his tears. The mother therefore being thus left alone, went down and mixed in the scene that has already been described, with such emotions as it must naturally produce. In the meantime, Peter had sent for La Marais, a surgeon in the neighborhood. La Marais was not at home, but his apprentice, Mr. Groslet, came in instantly. Upon examination, he found the body quite dead, and by this time, a papistical crowd of people were gathered about the house, and having by some means heard that Antony Callis was suddenly dead, and that the surgeon who examined the body declared that he had been strangled, they took it into their hands, he had been murdered. And as the family was Protestant, they presently supposed that the young man was about to change his religion and had been put to death for that reason. The poor father, overwhelmed with grief for the loss of his child, was advised by his friends to send for the officers of justice to prevent his being torn to pieces by the Catholic multitude who supposed he had murdered his son. 
This was accordingly done, and David, the chief magistrate or capital, took the father, Peter the son, the mother, the vice, and the maid, all into custody, and set a guard over them. He sent for M. de la Tour, a physician, and M. M. la Marquis and Perronet, surgeons, who examined the body for marks of violence, but found none except the mark of the ligature on the neck. They found also the hair of the deceased done up in the usual manner, perfectly smooth and without the least disorder. His clothes were also regularly folded up and laid upon the counter, nor was his shirt either torn or unbuttoned. Notwithstanding these innocent appearances, the capital thought proper to agree with the opinion of the mob and took it into his head that old Callus had sent for La Vice, telling him that he had a son to be hanged, that La Vice had come to perform the office of executioner, and that he had received assistance from the father and brother. As no proof of the supposed fact could be procured, the capital had recourse to a monetary or general information in which the crime was taken for granted and persons were required to give such testimony against it as they were able. This recites that Levice was commissioned by the Protestants to be their executioner in ordinary when any of their children were to be hanged for changing their religion. It recites also that when the Protestants thus hang their children, they compel them to kneel. And one of the interrogatories was whether any person had seen Antony Callus kneel before his father when he strangled him. It recites likewise that Antony died a Roman Catholic and requires evidence of his Catholicism. But before this monitory was published, the mob had gotten a notion that Antony Callus was the next day to have entered into the fraternity of the white penitents. The capital therefore caused his body to be buried in the middle of St. Stephen's Church. A few days after the internment of the deceased, the white penitents performed a solemn service for him in their chapel. The church was hung with white and a tomb was raised in the middle of it, on the top of which was placed a human skeleton, holding in one hand a paper on which was written, quote, abjuration of heresy, end quote, and in the other palm, the emblem of martyrdom. The next day, the Franciscans performed a service of the same kind for him. The capital continued the persecution with unrelenting severity, and without the least proof coming in, thought fit to condemn the unhappy father, mother, brother, friend, and servant to the torture, and put them all into irons on the 18th of November. From these dreadful proceedings, the sufferers appealed to the Parliament, which immediately took cognizance of the affair, and annulled the sentence of the capital as irregular. But they continued the prosecution, and upon the hangman, deposing it was impossible Antony should hang himself, as was pretended, the majority of the parliament were of the opinion that the prisoners were guilty and therefore ordered them to be tried by the criminal court of Toulouse. One voted him innocent, but after long debates and majority was for the torture and wheel, and probably condemned the father by way of experiment, whether he was guilty or not, hoping he would in the agony confess the crime and accuse the other prisoners whose fate therefore they suspended. Poor Callus, however, an old man of 68, was condemned to this dreadful punishment alone. He suffered the torture with great constancy and was led to execution in a frame of mind which excited the admiration of all that saw him, and particularly of the two Dominicans, Father Burgess and Father Coldegas, who attended him in his last moments and declared that they thought him not only innocent of the crime laid to his charge, but also an exemplary instance of true Christian patience, fortitude, and charity. When he saw the executioner prepared to give him the last stroke, he made a fresh declaration to Father Burgess, but while the words were still in his mouth, the capital, the author of this catastrophe, who came upon the scaffold merely to gratify his desire of being a witness of his punishment and death, ran up to him and bawled out, quote, Wretch, there are the faggots which are to reduce your body to ashes. Speak the truth. End quote. M. Callus made no reply, but turned his head a little aside, and that moment the executioner did his office. The popular outcry against this family was so violent in Long Dock that everybody expected to see the children of Callus broke upon the wheel and the mother burnt alive. 
Young Donne Callis was advised to fly into Switzerland. He went and found a gentleman who at first could only pity and relieve him, without daring to judge of the rigor exercised against the father, mother, and brothers. Soon after, one of the brothers who was only banished likewise threw himself into the arms of the same person, who for more than a month took every possible precaution to be assured of the innocence of the family. Once convinced, he thought himself obliged in conscience to employ his friends, his purse, his pen, and his credit to repair the fatal mistake of the seven judges of Toulouse and to have the proceedings revised by the king's council. This revision lasted three years, and it is well known what honor Messrs. de Grosne and Baquancourt acquired by investigating this memorable cause. Fifty masters of the court of request unanimously declared the whole family of Callus innocent and recommended them to the benevolent justice of His Majesty. The Duc de Choiseul, who never let slip an opportunity of signalizing the greatness of his character, not only assisted this unfortunate family with money, but obtained for them a gratuity of 36,000 livres from the king. On the 9th of March, 1765, the arrest was signed, which justified the family of Callus and changed their fate. The 9th of March, 1762, was the very day on which the innocent and virtuous father of that family had been executed. All Paris ran in crowds to see them come out of prison and clapped their hands for joy, while the tears streamed from their eyes. This dreadful example of bigotry employed the pen of Voltaire in deprecation of the horrors of superstition, and though an infidel himself, his essay on toleration does honor to his pen, and has been a blessed means of abating the rigor of persecution in most European states. Gospel purity will equally shun superstition and cruelty, as the mildness of Christ's tenets teaches only to comfort in this world and to procure salvation in the next. To persecute for being of a different opinion is as absurd as to persecute for having a different countenance. If we honor God, keep sacred the pure doctrines of Christ, put a full confidence in the promises contained in the Holy Scriptures, and obey the political laws of the state in which we reside, we have an undoubted right to protection instead of persecution and to serve heaven as our consciences regulated by the gospel rules may direct 